Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the required reading for Haters Without a Cause, the expanded universe. Today, I have a very, very special guest here with me, the one and only M67V. Go ahead and introduce also, yourself, sir. Also known as Muhammad, also known as Ibrahim's brother, also known as, um, well, you follow me on Instagram, at MJ Silla 67 So, full disclosure, I am what you would call a muggle when it comes to media consumption and critique. Although, I do think that uh, my perspective is still valuable because there's some things that I'm frankly confused about or I don't necessarily agree with, and we're going to get into that. Well, your perspective absolutely is valuable. You know, we welcome all muggles and non-muggles alike here on, on Haters Without a Cause. So why don't you go ahead and introduce the topic for today, since you wanted to talk about it on this show for a while now. Right, so we watched two shitty movies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the first one was The Room, which is, like, well known as, like, a, a really terrible movie. What do you and, mean? The Room movie was amazing. Uh, well, it's amazing in that it's amazing that some a movie like that can exist. <laughs> and the budget was like, what, $10 million? And it still ended up like that? It makes you wonder, where did the $10 million go? Anyway. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, it was great. The, there's just so many memes that came from it. Mm -hmm. It was great. It was a, a holy pilgrimage to watch that movie for the first time. I and, feel like it's a rites of passage. Oh, yeah. I feel like, low-key, everybody should watch that movie. Just to be a palate cleanser as to like what makes a movie terrible. I almost want to say it's so bad that it's good, but it's just, like, that. <laughs> <laughs> but we watched another movie called Karen, and that was, that was, like, actually terrible to watch. Like, the, the difference between that and The Room is The Room is, like, it's just comically bad. But Karen is insultingly bad, if that makes sense. Why don't you go over the difference between the two from your perspective? Like the room, you kind of get the sense that um, even the directors were having fun. You know, like even they weren't taking it all that seriously. Karen is different. They, they tried to be serious. They're trying to convey a serious message, but it just, it's trash. <laughs> it's just so poorly executed. Because, well, also the room is like, you're not going to learn anything from that. It's just like entertainment, really. I mean, supposedly a dark comedy. Well, at least that's how they try to frame it as later. Where a dark comedy. Karen is like trying to be... What what's the word? Almost Socially like a cautionary, aware. almost like a cautionary tale in a way. Yeah, they're trying to uh, they're trying to like educate people type shit about like uh, black issues. I have it on good authority that Coke Daniels, famous auteur, director of Karen, he wanted to open up uh, conversations about social issues with that movie, and I thought that was hilarious. But it's just cringe. You know, not to get into, like, how black people should act and stuff like that, but I really thought the movie was written by a white person. Just because, well, not because, like, I feel like black people should act this other way, but it's just, it's, the people in the very... movie, like, black people don't talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, but... 
it's very it feels very corporate and manufactured watching it and it's strange because this is a relatively low budget film but with a black director but like some of these lines would and this storyline is just trash bro like <laughs> black, ex- whoa, 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 black excellence my man <laughs> like these guys it's like just i don't know it's saying like hey man black excellence you know <laughs> you can't read it yeah like bro nobody says that or what, what was the one line when they were talking they saw the one dude on the news got shot yeah they shot him like his life didn't matter and the guy next to her is like yeah yeah black, black lives, lives matter, matter. <laughs> <laughs> According to this movie, all black people think and talk about is just just being black. That's their personality. Black. <laughs> Dude, it's like it was insulting. So I think the difference between that is the room. You can watch it by yourself and still have a good time just because it's just laughably terrible. But Karen is it's a little bit different. You know, it's insulting. Like, if you were to watch the movie by yourself, like, it would be miserable. Can, can I, so, so you have to link this to YouTube. So I'd I don't say know the what same I can for say. both movies. I don't know what I can say, what I can say, <laughs> but, okay, well, I'll say this. If, if you wanted to, wa- if, if it's you. it's bad, we can just cut it out, so go ahead. If you watch Karen by yourself, thinking that it was going to be a serious movie, like, you didn't know beforehand that it was going to be so terrible, like, that movie would make you want to self-delete. Yes. Suicide is okay. You you make you want to suicide yourself. <laughs> I think it's okay anyway. If not, I guess we'll find out the hard way. So, so my question is, as a movie critic, how do you when critiquing media or in this case movies, how do you differentiate what is objectively bad and what is subjectively bad because i think the room would you say that's subjectively bad because it's terrible but we we had a lot of fun watching it so subjectively i love the movie but it's for purely ironic reasons so i don't know how much that counts but i think it's like universally agreed that objectively there both movies are terrible are you asking like how do i come to that conclusion yeah how do i break it down yeah how what is what is your breakdown so the difference between an objective and subjective uh, assessment of a movie i guess is subjective is just how you feel that's the easy part and that part lives and dies with you but the objective that has existed before you and it will continue to be true long after you're gone and it's all based on the parts of the story that you can measure um the most the most basic definition of a story i think everyone can agree on this is just it's a sequence of events right um thing a happens followed by thing b so we would then it stands to reason that you could objectively judge it by how well those pieces connect together and if there are like breaks in continuity if there are story threads that don't go anywhere if plot elements are held together with like flimsy causality then we would we could deem that a bad story the same way a pair of scissors that doesn't cut correctly would be a bad pair of scissors because that's its function Mm. um the way I break it down, I break down a story by plot, character, world, and theme. Um, I think the room stands out as just like just failing on all fronts. The plot is is spaghetti. <laughs> there are <laughs> there are subplots that open up and just don't get resolved. Uh, the scenes feel like they're out of order. Uh, characters just change personalities and motivations from scene to scene. Uh, what, what is there to say about theme? It's just, what is the theme? There's, there's a lack of cohesion. What I think that's the thing. There is no theme. It's just this event happens, and then this event happens, and uh, shit, I forget what even happened in that movie. 
Well, I guess if you wanted to be like really generous as to what uh, Tommy Wiseau was intending, maybe you could say that like, you know, lack of communication can destroy relationships or something. Or doesn't he, doesn't Johnny say at one point, like, if people, everyone loved each other, the world would be a better place? I don't know. Is the thing, is the message that, like, there's not enough love? The point is, whatever you decide the theme is, it was executed horribly. Okay, fine. Let's be fair for a second, okay? So, I think the overarching theme, or, like, the plot of the movie is Lisa. Okay. Johnny was in love with Lisa, but Lisa doesn't love him back for reasons. Because he said he's boring. <laughs> right, because <laughs> he's boring. <laughs> <laughs> so Which, she, all right, okay. So, um, she pretends. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. She does pretend to, you know, still be in love with them and still go on with the wedding and stuff like that whole time, like. She's cheating on him with his friends, and she's making up stories about um, Johnny, like, beating him or, like, being abusive towards him. Yes. And he didn't get the... Pro- <laughs> Don't forget, he didn't get the promotion. To, to which his mom... To which her mom says, endure. <laughs> anyway. No, no, no. She says, <laughs> he was drinking last night, and then he hit me. And she goes, Johnny doesn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> was like comically missing the point didn't it's she like she much, didn't hear the other part didn't she pretty much tell him to endure well she just ignores everything lisa says and just says like you know he has a good job he loves you etc so endure so endure <laughs> <laughs> endure who, who cares about the physical anyway but the theme i guess is what what is like the message you know what is the the overarching, uh, I guess, idea that ties it all together. So I think the overarching idea, right, is that she's just, like, unfaithful to him. And they have a failing relationship, which is a fairly standard, like, predictable plot line. But instead of having a bunch of things... I think what... What's the guy's name? Tommy Wazoo, the director? I think what he yeah. tried to do is have the events happen... Have them be, like, a build-up as to, like, you know, this is, like, up until, like, the final straw. But what instead happened was... We have some build-up, we have the final straw in, like, the middle of the movie, and then the rest is just, like, a bunch of nonsense before Johnny spirals. Some of it, some of which have, like, nothing to do with the actual relationship, just, like, oh, this random event happens. Well, like Denny getting in trouble with like drug dealers, that goes nowhere. Didn't we like never see? We got one. <laughs> we had one scene for that, and then never. It's not even mentioned. It's not even brought up. No. No, it was just. And for some reason, I don't know if they have like mad house keys that he gave to all his friends or something people just be coming in and out of that house I yeah don't know what people that's just about. walk in and out of his home they should have named it the house instead of the room because <laughs> <laughs> pretty much everybody has access to that house for well the reason. house is all it's just one big room isn't it and then there's the upstairs where they have the big sex oh my god the freaking sex scenes. yeah there's a gratuitous amount of sex scenes that go out for go on for way too long 25 percent of the movie was that slight exaggeration but i don't even say. think so <laughs> <laughs> it might even be something close to that <laughs> maybe but yeah to bring it back the theme is a hard one to talk about because you know a lot of time theme exists comfortably in your brain and a movie can resonate with anyone in different ways but that would be the subjective part but a movie having an idea that's the easy part it's executing that is where we would judge how good or bad it succeeded um i think an example we can both agree on is the devil wears prada um doesn't uh because andy is working at the the fashion place and she gets in trouble for not taking her job seriously enough. And the narrative uh, paints her as being in the wrong for not taking it seriously. But then she starts to take it seriously. And then it starts alienating her from all of her friends. 
and the narrative still treats her like she's in the wrong so we're almost like confused like are is the message so like is the message to be uh take your job seriously or i guess if i wanted to be generous to the movie it's like take your job seriously but not to the point where you like lose who you are but that doesn't happen in the movie she's still the same person essentially can we talk about the devil wears prada for a second okay how was it how was that movie received by critics it's it's generally uh favorable it's considered to be a good movie that that's considered to be a good movie i think it's a i think it's decent i think the theme was was botched along the way look it's not that i didn't enjoy watching it it's just like okay first of all (laughs) these guys in the fashion industry they were all just bro they were so unlikable so unlikable i don't know if they did that did they do that on purpose Apparently not, because we're supposed to think that Andy was wrong for not taking them seriously at first. But okay, okay. Here's fine. where the like, conversation gets complicated because likable is subjective. Um, bro, I you're don't, just dickheads. <laughs> I don't like. Well, this is the thing. I don't like Miranda as a person. I wouldn't want to be her friend, but I think she's a very well written character. Sure, sure, and I I guess she she gets her work done, so I guess that's all that matters. Yeah. Okay. I, fine. You're I not... really appreciate the amount of work they went into like writing so- her as someone who, you know, she's harsh to a lot of people, but she's always busy. Every scene she's in, she's doing something related to her job. She's not just sitting at a desk and ordering people around. Okay. Fine. So in in the work environment, I understand you're not gonna get along with everyone, you know. But then. It's like you said, she didn't take the job seriously. I'm like, well, this this is stupid as hell. But then she eventually did started working hard. And her friends were like, bro, her friends. Oh, her friends were like shitting on her Andy for taking the her worst job. Friends. We didn't even talk about her boyfriend. Who <laughs> did, did he like leave her? I think he at left the her at one point, and then her friends also were trying to to use her new position to, like, get favors or whatever, or, like, get discounts on uh, the fashionisms that she was working on. And I don't... Okay, I don't remember exactly what happened. I'm still fuzzy on a lot of details, because yeah. I only watched it the one time. But at, by the end of the movie, we found out that, surprise, surprise, Miranda's a dickhead. And so Andy was like, no, fuck this shit. I'm quitting. Yeah, I think by the third act, it's like Miranda is definitely the antagonist. And Andy has to, you know, not lose her integrity. So that's why she makes her decision to leave her at the end. But then this is where the the theme runs into a problem again. Miranda, she ends up getting the new job because Miranda put in a good word for her. So it's almost like she's rewarded for taking her job seriously to the point of losing herself. So the the theme is just like, it's completely confused. We don't know at what point, like what was Andy supposed to do? That's the mess. That's the, the question that I'm left with. I feel like movies like this are supposed to give you more clarity on certain aspects of life, but it's just like, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, I, I'd have to watch that movie again to see how well it holds up. Because, like, I think the the theme is executed horribly. But everything else, it, it might be okay. I'm not sure. It might be, like... It might come down to, like, a five or a six. And the maybe. P- plot is so unfair to Andy. It's like, no matter what, Andy's, like, the, wrong, the one in the wrong. Yeah, I think she gets unfairly shit on in that movie. All the time. I don't know what that's about. Because the movie clearly presents the fashion people as being, like, hoity-toity, like, very uptight. So, I think it's reasonable for, you know, Andy to take the piss out of them a little. But the, all of a sudden, the, the movie turns on her and they're like, the, the movie's like, how dare you? You should respect these people. <laughs> I mean, do you see what these people do? Okay, okay. Here's the thing, right? 
uh, okay maybe this is just me this might be a hot take but i think you can respect somebody's work the you know the contributions the work ethic but you don't have to respect them as a person yeah, I'm Especially happy to if they agree don't with that. You. Because, well, an example that immediately comes to mind is, to me, is Elon Musk. Like, dude on SpaceX, Tesla Motors, uh, Twitter now. What should I say? X? Anyway. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, he has ma- he's had major contributions, you know, as far as, like, what he's done and not his adventures but like the products that he he's come up with and his work ethic and he's just like an insanely intelligent individual but would i want to spend a long time with him probably not <laughs> do i not, do i would i want to live with him probably not do i think that he's respectable like as a person you know as he the way he treats other people definitely not Yeah, and I think uh, Miranda in Devil Wears Prada is portrayed in that, in that manner. It's like, yeah, she's a dick, but like, the results speak for themselves as to like what she's done. She's a big name in the fashion world, and for very good reason. She's extremely good at her job. I mean, she is the devil, right? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I think the devil is referring to her. Yeah. But I think... Th- we were we're almost meant to believe that like she sort of earned her place in the fashion industry, so she's kind of earned the right to, I guess, pick on whoever she chooses. Ugh. That just rubs me the wrong way personally. Maybe that's why I feel the type of way that about that movie. So okay, my. I guess my beef with, like, movie critics, yourself included, motherfucker. Just kidding. <laughs> is my problem with a lot of these movie reviews or even game reviews is that the objectivity aspect as to like how you rate a form of media seems to vary a lot between the reviewers and I feel like more often than not even though most people enjoy the movie, they they still have some stuff to say about it, and they still give it a bad rating off of off of stuff that ultimately doesn't matter that much. Cause my thing is, depending on the type of movie too, if it's like an action movie, especially like comedy, what should matter more is like whether you enjoy the movie or not, and. I personally think that a lot of these movie reviews, they pick on it, and then they give it a bad rating, which doesn't matter to me, but to somebody who's never seen the movie before, they don't know what it's about. They're going to see that rating and be like, okay, I probably shouldn't waste my time, because movies take a lot of time. They're like an hour and a half, two hours long. Oh, I have a load of questions then. Okay. All right, so you said... um. Uh, movie critics slash reviewers will see a movie that people really like and give it a low rating. Or do you think that um movie should be reviewed based on how many people enjoy it? Hmm. I think you should just keep the audience in mind. Like, who is this movie for? What are they looking for? What do they want from this movie? And does this movie deliver? And if so, the rating should reflect that. Now, oh, well, I think that this character should have... So it shouldn't be the deciding factor, but it should be important to consider. Yeah. Now, I, I feel like people throw... Reviews throw um, the word predictable around too much. I actually agree. <laughs> oh, you agree? Yeah. Yeah, because I think if that's your thing, right... You just re- review movies for a living. Of course, you're going to see themes. Of course, you're going to see, like, repositions of, like... Like tropes. And it, exactly. And then it's going to become predictable to you. But I don't think most people are like that. I think most people watch movies every once in a while. So 
predictability doesn't matter. Oh, oh my God! It's, okay, I will. I didn't have a clear stance now, but now I'm. It's, I'm starting to develop a clear stance. With a lot of these movies that are enjoyable to the audience that it's meant for, they shit on them a lot for predictability, and then that's what causes them to rate to give them lukewarm to low ratings. Hey, and if, um, I'm right there with you, railing on people who use predictability as a criticism. Predictability is not an indicator of of quality. Um, I've seen stories where I knew exactly what was going to happen, but because of how it was executed, I enjoyed them a lot. Um, if it's predictable and it's executed poorly, then that's yeah. what I would be rating it by, not just because it's predictable. And predictability is also subjective, so there you go. Yeah, that it'll be one thing if it's poorly executed. Also, I mean, I understand that you can do things differently. In my opinion, just because you can do things differently doesn't mean you should. And I think the problem is when people say, when people complain about, oh, we're just getting the same, more of the same, we want something different. The problem is, is there's not much that you can do differently without like doing some crazy shit or doing some something that's like dumb that that pe- people don't want and i'm gonna bring music as an example like all right but this isn't over <laughs> okay okay but just, just as a quick just as a quick example so i started getting into rap two years ago no three years ago whatever yeah, three years ago. And remember how, like, everybody shit on Playboy Cardi for making the same type of music all the time? And Yeah, um, I do remember that. Oh, so you, even you remember? No, and, I'm just helping you out. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then he came out with Whole Lot of Red at the end of 2020, and he completely changed his style, and it divided his fans so much. And then he's like, What? You guys wanted something different, so you you know what I mean. Like I I just did what you guys asked for, and now it's like his fans are divided between people that listen to old Playboy Cardi and people that listen to like all Playboy Cardi, I guess, in, including his new stuff. But his his new stuff like has almost nothing to do with his his old stuff. So to my point, just because you can't. Just because you can do things differently doesn't mean you should. Wait. Different not, doesn't, that's not a start. Different doesn't equal good. It, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly. Different doesn't equal good. And I think if you... See, I'm all about consistency, right? Who can I always go to? In the case of media, what director can I always go to? What genre can I always go to and get like what I expect? Oh, I don't know about genre. Genre is extremely broad. I think, well, once you narrow it down, you know what I mean? Because there's all different types of comedy. Okay, so what kind of comedy? Like a a romantic comedy. Like if if you're looking for a rom-com and you see some shit about like, I don't know, aliens. (laughs) You know what I mean? He's going to be like, what the fuck? a rom-com in space. I guess... All right, so what did you want well, to say? No, let's explore it. Do you think a rom-com in space can't be good? I mean, it can, but... Just take a rom-com <laughs> that you really, really <laughs> like, or one that you think has a good story, replace the characters with aliens, replace the setting from Earth to space. It's the same story. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right, well, what if there was a rom-com that had to do with spiders? But that could work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, but that, uh, that's not that's not what I'm looking for. That's not what you're looking for. <laughs> no, I I like to think that all of these, you know, the spider movie, the alien movie, the human movie, they could all exist under the same umbrella. I don't think it should it should be considered no longer a rom com just because it, oh, no, it's it, not it, humans. It, it can be, but. Hold up. Okay, I think a better example 
would be to say, what if, uh, like in 2024, right, movie critics keep shitting on rom-coms because they, it's, just, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And then everyone that's making rom-coms says, fuck it, we're going to expand. And all of a sudden, rom-coms are no longer about human beings. Like, none of the rom-coms in 2024 are no longer about human beings. This is a very extreme example, but they're all about, like, algae or, or fish <laughs> or, or aliens or spiders. And, there's, and it's all some crazy shit that has nothing to do with, like, what would actually happen in, like, humanity. If they were good, I'd be okay with that. I think a, a, a worse problem if people were like, oh, rom-coms are all the same. It's always guy meets girl. They fall in love. A bunch of stupid things happen. And they end up married at the end. So they're like, okay, we're going to do something different. We're going to have rom-coms, you know, without romance and without comedy. It's like, well, it's not a rom-com at that point, is it? Oh, yeah, I think that'll be a better That's more like foundational. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it has, it stars human or algae or spiders, whatever. I think that's more superficial. But I would still be annoyed. <laughs> it was funny. I guess if all if we just like got rid of humans altogether, I'd I'd be a little confused by that. I'd be very annoyed. But um, you know, I I don't want to you know subscribe to the idea that stories that don't star humans can't be deep or meaningful. I mean, just this year we saw a really good movie about like the nature of death and you know what it means to live and being faced with your own mortality do you remember the movie it was supposed in boots oh i was thinking about the one pixar shit i forget the name oh soul yeah no this was this year post in boots the last switch is a lot better than soul i'm just gonna put that out there that movie oh yeah really good way better way better but I want to go back to, um, okay. you know, knowing your audience. Um, a movie critic should know what the movie's audience is, what it's trying to deliver, how well it delivers it, etc. You, you, th- that is a statement you would agree with? Yes. So wh- what, who do you think the room's audience is? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the room doesn't even know what type of movie it is. So, However, having said that, I can I know who Karen's audience is. Okay, let's work with Karen. Um I think it's uh the audience is like sort of left wing mm-hmm. people like activists, maybe people on the right who want to understand people on the left, or maybe white people that want to understand where black people are coming from. And that's why I have such an issue with that movie because it does a terrible job at explaining black issues. It, I, and again, it's, it's as if the movie, like, it's as if the director of the movie has never met or, like, talked to actual black people because they just don't act like that. It just seems like a caricature of how black activists talk online in, like, really fringe, like, crazy spaces. And and that's the reference point. And on the flip side, the, the antagonist uh, in the movie, which are presumably the white people. White people. <laughs> it's fucking insane. Again, it's a, it's a caricature of what people think racist white people actually act. Yeah, when, I don't even it. think racist... Like, move like that. I don't even <laughs> think Karen's move like the way Karen in the movie. She does, like, one Karen-ish thing in the whole movie, which is, like, get the guys kicked out of the restaurant. And then the other thing, I guess, is complain about the trash. The rest of the movie, she's just, like, violently, like, openly racist. Well, no, and, she's just a psychopath. And then, well, in the third act, she turns into a murderer for no reason. Right. She goes from, like... I, I I like these black people to move out of my neighborhood to, like, I have to kill these Negroes. There's no other option. <laughs> Just, like, breaking and entering. It's abs- I- it's insane to watch. She, like, slides into, like, psychopath territory. And you can even see her, like, she's, like, evil laughing, maniacal laughing. Just uh, having these crazy faces. And you know what? Like, bro, what the hell she is this? She didn't ask to speak to a manager even once in the entire movie. 
No. What an absolute... You had one job. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. But the question I want to ask is, um, say all of the leftists, all of them ever, they hear what you just said and they're like, I don't care about that. Um, Karen is amazing. Does that make Karen a good movie now? Since you decided that that's its audience and they like the movie. Hmm. Good question. I'm 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 going to red pill you on this. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. Ah, uh, well, hmm. well, I think the audience would be wrong. <laughs> Just you know be- what? I agree. <sighs> Just because. Well, I think objectively. Mm-hmm. See, see, this is the problem that you face as a. I I would imagine you would face as a critic because how. How do you be? When does the objectivity slip into subjective? Because, I I was gonna say that objectively, I feel like it does a poor job of explaining black issues and explaining racism, but, then again, that's how I feel. Well, this is where it's like. We have the the movie is all we have to work with. So is the message compatible with the events of the film? The met what what would you even say the message of Karen is? Don't be racist. Racism is bad. <laughs> Racism bad. <laughs> um white people bad. Okay. Alright, let me let me let me try to be more charitable. Well, I- let's go to like a slightly more reasonable example. We'll go back to Devil Wears Prada. We just went over how the theme of the movie is not compatible with the events of the film. Mm-hmm. It, it works against the theme. And it leaves you unsure of what the theme even is. That is something you can objectively measure. What mm-hmm. you take away from the movie is completely up to you. Well, I think... Like, someone could think the room is meaningful because they also have been in a situation where their fiancé cheated on them with their best friend. But, of course, that doesn't make the movie good because that's what makes it meaningful to you. I think you can... There is... There might be a way to objectively measure just how realistic Karen is. How, How does it relate to reality? Well, I don't know how... But there's probably a way to prove that objectively it's just not realistic. And the movie is trying to be realistic. And that's trying to show you this can happen to you too. But it doesn't. I don't think that's something that you would need to like prove with empirical data or whatever. Because like you just look at that and you it's it's cartoonish in like how it's portrayed here's the thing here's if the you point. want to be objective you can say like this is a very unnuanced view of racism here's the problem common sense is no longer common yeah. i'm sure there is some crazy far left far left that's gonna see that movie and be like this confirms what i've already believed in this is how racist people act this is how white people act someone could think that but they would be wrong if they would if they're if they're making a general like blanket statement i'm sure there's some psychopath out there who acts exactly like karen does in this movie but like we would agree that like that's that's the fringe that is is like the one percent but this is the this is the problem this movie is gonna resonate with them and the people that already know that this is ridiculous are gonna say like this is ridiculous. Yeah. That, that's why I have an issue with this movie because there's going to be a few people out there that's going to be like, oh, see, I'm not the only one. And see, this movie, like, clearly there's tons of people out there that believe the same thing that I do. So that's, that's the point of the movie. It's trying to spread a message. It's not trying to be... Enter- well, I guess it is trying to be entertaining, but it's, it's trying to p- put a message out there. And the message is just wrong so maybe we shouldn't use audience reaction as an indicator for whether or not a movie is good see i don't think i don't think you should use audience reaction i think 
you should know who the audience is and what they're looking for. You see the difference? Well, what if they get something that they're not looking for, but it turns out really good? Or at least they 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 all seem to like it. I think it all comes down to how well do you know the audience? How well do you know the the person that this movie is intended for? Do you think um, Karen not knowing... Would, wait, first, would you say that Karen doesn't know its audience? Or what its audience wants? I think they know what audience they want to reach, but they don't know anything about that audience. <laughs> Does that make sense? But that would that would be an indicator that it's bad. Then right? yes, yes. Okay, so it's not about the reaction. No, no, it's not about the reaction. It's just, it's about does this understand the assignment? Okay, but. Th- I mean, you would agree that surely that that's something you can be objective of. Yeah, because I think every form of media has its um ha- has its intended audience and has its like purpose. You know, whether it's for entertainment, absolutely, uh, cautionary tale, uh, laughter, just for laughs. They all have its uh its intended purpose. Okay. Um, I guess the next thing I wanted to go over with you is um, you said, um, you know, critics can give a bad score to a movie that you feel doesn't deserve it because it's it's well liked or it reaches its audience well or whatever, and that can discourage the uh, reader, I guess, from going to see the movie. So. You said that reviews should be based on whether or not you enjoy the movie. Do you still stand by that? Uh, Okay, well, let me revise that for a second, right? I think that... Well, here's a problem, too, right? I think if you're a critic for a long time... Especially if, like, that's... That's your thing. Like, depending on who you are, you can kind of lose, like... you, you, You... Stop thinking like a muggle, for example, or a person that just enjoys movies, or even a movie buff, and you start thinking like a critic. And just certain things are going to bother you that it's not going to bother someone else. And then it's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. That's that's not reflective, and it's just not going to be reflective as to how other people watch the movies. So I think, I know I keep repeating myself, but just know who your audience is and what feeds into them. So you're saying reviews should be written from the perspective of the common moviegoer? Yes. Yes. Because, okay, I'm going to give an unrelated example, right? So I probably should have uh, introduced myself as a car enthusiast. I'm a major car enthusiast. So... What I like about uh, a server reviewer named Jason Camisa is he reviews cars in the perspective of like who is gonna be the target audience, who's gonna who who's the one that's actually buying this car. So, in other words, if you review a Lamborghini in the perspective of someone that wants a minivan, well, you're gonna say like, well, this car sucks. It only seats two people and I can't put any anything in it. Why would I want this thing? And vice versa. If you review a minivan and you're expecting a Lamborghini, you're, you're gonna be very dis- you're gonna be very underwhelmed. Like, whoa, this does this isn't fast. This doesn't sound very good. This is not entertaining. It doesn't look that good. Alright, well, um, Okay, so are you, are you done with that example? Well, I just want to quickly conclude that I think people should review anything in that matter. You know, put yourself in the mindset of the intended consumer. All right. So you said that critics will they'll often talk about things that don't matter. So what, what would an example of that be? Well...
I think in comedies, for example, sometimes characters don't have to be that deep. Why do they have to be like that nuanced or advanced or different than like the common person? Because that's not the point of the movie. It's supposed to be funny. That would be one example. Okay. Um... And rom coms, like people, they don't, I, they, again, like as far as being like predictable and repetitive, I think those are allowed to be predictable and repetitive because. If you say rom com, you already know what to expect. You you don't. You don't want some crazy shit. Cause you're just trying to like relax and like watch a romantic movie, probably with a significant other, or. Well, well, ideally would be with a significant other. Yeah, just kind of like a fun, down to earth movie that leaves you feeling warm and fuzzy inside, right? Exactly. Does that make sense? Am yeah, I making sense? I see where you're coming from. So I, my next question then would be like, what is what are the things that do matter? What should critics be talking about when they're talking about a comedy? Should they talk about how much it made them laugh? Yeah, just like the... Like, if you can criticize the creativeness... Of like, in a comedy, if you can criticize the creativeness of anything, it has to be the jokes or the delivery. The... What's it called? I'm, I'm blanking. Just like the little bits of it that are supposed to be funny. I think that would, that would, it would make more sense to criticize that than anything else. Because it's a comedy at the end of the day, so you're expecting to laugh. So if all the jokes suck, then you'd be like, well, this movie's not very good. And what I if, respect that. What if there are two reviewers of the same comedy, one found every joke funny and one didn't laugh at any of the jokes? It's not like they're a humorless person. Both the reviewers love comedy, but this mm-hmm. one just didn't work for them. Which one is the consumer supposed to sort of trust? Uh, see, if it's if it's like a um, would you would you consider a company like a a review company or a magazine? Let's just say a, it's a review website. We'll just say it's a, like a conglomerate. Right. So ideally, what I would do is, if I was in charge of that review website, I would assign someone who I, f- I feel is most likely to get the movie to be the one reviewing it. Because if two reviewers review the same movie and one found it funny and one said, like, this movie sucks, then their sense of humor, well, they both ideally have a sense of humor, but one is clearly Mm -hmm. um, more adapted to it than the other. So you'd have to figure out why does it resonate with one, but it doesn't work with the other. Uh, that's a neat cop out, but this conclusion is is baked in the two. This I'm asking, what does the consumer do in that situation? What does the consumer do? Yeah. What I would like to think the consumer does is instead of just looking at the rating and be and just taking that and run with it, to actually read the review and find out why did they rate the movie the way they did. That's what I do personally, but I know. Not enough people do that. But these are these are like spoiler-free reviews. One reviewer says, the jokes in this movie were really funny. I liked that every single one. The other one says, I, the jokes in this movie didn't land for me. Well, that's not why people don't read reviews. It's not because they're afraid of it getting spoilers. It's just because they're lazy. Sure. But this is a, this is a consumer who uses reviews as a... Because they do exist. People who use reviews as a determinant for whether they're going to see a movie. But there's not enough of them. That's the problem. There's not enough people that take the time to to not only read the review, but to critically think, okay, so this is this person's take on it. How does this apply to me? What I'm getting at is if both reviewers use the same standard, do you not agree that that would be a lot easier on the consumer? 
Yeah, it will be a lot easier. But they don't, which they is don't. why you should um, read the description. That is where the... That is why I'm in favor of the objective review. Because humor is subjective. You can't tell someone what they're going to find funny. But what you can do is break down jokes mechanically. And be like, a lot of the jokes in this movie... You might find them funny, but like they don't make sense like narratively or they're delivered in awkward ways uncreative like, yeah or um you can a movie that makes the same joke over and over it'd be like it's very monotonous or yeah. if someone was reviewing like you know madagascar 3 for example you can say like the the afro circus bit is overplayed um because of how overexposed it was into the trailers these are all objective statements you can make and the consumer can read that and be like, okay, I'll keep this in mind when I go see the movie, but I will form my own opinion after I go see it. I think that's so much better and so much easier to work with because if every reviewer made reviews and wrote them based on how they personally felt about the movie, you would get scores on all corners of the spectrum and the consumer wouldn't even know where to start. I wish there were more consumers like that. <laughs> That's all I got to say. That's like the ideal, perfect, critically thinking consumer that just doesn't exist all that much. Well, the way I see it is like I can't control the the reviewers or the consumer, but I can control how I review media. And I try to be as objective as I can. Um... I've had to criticize movies that I really like, and I've had to give points to to movies that I absolutely loathe. But for what it's worth, I'll add my own personal opinion and my own personal score at the end. Yeah, I guess. My thing is, I guess I I I wish reviewers of media were more. Ah. Uh, like they reviewed movies more consistently across the board and yeah. they would be held more accountable <laughs> for just giving poor ratings on movies that don't deserve it. Okay, what do you think about Rotten you know Tomatoes? What? I agree. Um I think Rotten Tomatoes is is pretty are pretty much useless in determining the quality of a movie. I okay, I'm so glad you said that because I felt that way like about them the whole time. I was yes. like, bro, who cares what these like, I know some, like, don't don't get me wrong, they shit on some movies that deserve to be shot on, but yeah. other than that, it's like, bro, who, who are these guys? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, like, the way I use Rotten Tomatoes is just to use it as, like, a an indicator of the current zeitgeist. You know, what is the current public opinion of such and such movie? Because I think that is useful. But if someone were to tell me... You can't say Toy Story 4 is bad. It has like a 99 on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> be like, right. Fuck off. That movie's terrible. I don't care <laughs> how many people. sucks. Yeah, I don't care how, what the score is on the tomato meter. Exactly. Because it's, it's almost meaningless to me. And I'm right there with you that a lot of movie reviews suck. Because a lot of them just are like... Um, how much they enjoyed it but like even when they try to be more objective they they just use like very vague statements to be like oh toy story 4 is amazing it like it like pushes the boundaries of of woody's character and like what a toy story movie can be it's like (laughs) you're not telling me anything i need like specifics you know exactly know we get into spoiler territory but like so be it i want to know what i'm getting into okay this is my Let's do this for a second, right? This is my ideal media review site, right? So, the reviewer, they have the objective, right? They have the objective review. And then they have the personal take of the movie. Yeah. And with either one, it's, it's going to be like TV shows, right? Where you can expand the sections that will give spoilers, but it will... It will more in depth. It'll go more in depth of the quality. Exactly. Yeah, that's um. 
I would love if every review website was structured that way. That's how I structure my reviews. I have a breakdown of the entire plot. That lets me have some fun and provide commentary along the way. But I'll also talk about, I'll have serious conversations about the writing. And then I'll do like a summation. Um, I'll go over the plot, character, world theme, how well the movie accomplished those things. And then uh, tally them up, generate a score, and then give my own personal opinion. I think that's how it should be across the board but unfortunately it's not Who, who's another movie review site that we can shit on uh chris stuckman he oh, I've never likes everything that comes out oh i've never heard of him oh which which that's annoying too especially if it's like <laughs> i don't know like the Disney shit has just been kind of pissing me off lately. Yeah, I um, I would sooner trust people who. We might be going into a different topic, but I would trust people who are able to be negative, more than people who just like, unconditionally, are positive about everything. That's the problem. There's no in between, right? As always, because I think psychologically I hesitate to use that word but psychologically if you see a negative review you kind of automatically well a lot of people automatically assume like okay this this is just that person being honest well I think I th a lot of people get catharsis from people shitting on things that are bad that's why like angry video game nerd and nostalgic critic got so popular yeah but I think as far as like less animated you know reviewers like them because oh i'd agree those, those are the anime. those are definitely more like performative i think when people see a negative review on something they automatically assume like okay this is the review be honest because people are socially like expected to be positive be very positive and very glowing there's like yeah. that pressure to be super positive and when they go against that, it's like, oh, this person is being honest. And I think with some reviewers in general, not even just like with media, they take that a little too far. And they just become nitpicky. Oh, I'd, I'd love to get into this with you. Can you what, what is your definition of a nitpick? Can we, def can we get your definition of a nitpick, please? Definition or an example? Uh, one or the other? Because my definition is... When... See... When you can just tell that this person is pointing out... Like... is, is When they're reaching for flaws. Mm -hmm. When there's not much to be said. But they're reaching for things. Especially for things that don't take away... From the movie, like the example that I gave was um, when I, I said that characters don't have to be that deep and like advanced or serious in comedies because that's besides the point. To for like the opposite, conversely, if a movie is supposed to be informative or a, or a documentary is supposed to be informative and they're like, well, this wasn't very funny or entertaining. I know not many people are going to say that, but that's just like an example. Extreme example, but it's true. When it feels like they're reaching for things just so, just for the sake of like being negative. Oh, uh, to just, just to probe your brain a little bit here. If that person saw it, watched a documentary and the documentary got a historical fact wrong and they pointed that out, would that be a nitpick? No. Okay, good. <laughs> Especially if they can... If within the review they can back it up and they can prove that it's wrong, absolutely do that. What if, um, you know, they're showing like a time card indicating the place and time and it's like Brooklyn, 1960, but it accidentally says uh, Brooklyn, 1961. Is that a nitpick? No, I don't think so. Because that would annoy me, to be honest.
Yeah, I would say that's an editing error. Or maybe I'm nitpicking. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I, I can be a bit nitpicky when it comes to facts like that, even if it's just slightly off. My definition of a nitpick is something that is not relevant to the story, but it is valid. Mm. So say, um, uh, in one scene, the character's shoes are blue, and then the next scene, that they're pink. It's like, that doesn't mean anything. It's mm. worth pointing out, but, like, that doesn't affect the story in any way. But, like, if the villain of the story is defeated by looking at the color pink, it's like, what the fuck, you know? Because <laughs> we didn't get a scene where he changed the color sure. of his shoes. That yeah, that would annoy me, too. Well, I, I imagine that could, like, pull someone right out of the movie. Because be like, you wouldn't even be paying attention to that. And you'd be like, what? <laughs> well, even if it's not relevant, something like that would still annoy me. Yeah. Or, um, say you're, uh, watching, I guess, Lord of, Lord of the Rings, something that takes place in Middle Earth. I know there is, um, a controversy about, like, how in one shot you can briefly see, like, a, a modern car or something, but it's, like, all the way in the distance. It's, like, that doesn't change anything about the story, but it is a, it is a flaw that they left that in there, you know? Yeah. Um. Which would annoy me too, by the way. <laughs> The example you gave about how, like, comedy characters are not expected to be, like, deep, meaningful, whatever. If the if the movie wants us to believe that they are deep, uh, whatever you mean that to be, and they aren't, is that a nitpick? No, that's fair. Because the movie, you know, the advertising is one thing, but it's not delivering. So that's that's a fair criticism. It looks like we're mostly on the same page. So like yeah. a review that's like mostly comprised of nitpicks is not a good review. Or I guess a deeper go into my definition of nitpick is just when they're trying to, when they feel an obligation to say something negative about the movie, just, just. For the sake of saying it. So they try to make some some they try to find issues that are not even there. They try to make something out of nothing for other words. Do you have an example of that? Are there any times where you feel like I nitpicked for a movie? <sighs> there probably is, but <laughs> but I can't <laughs> I can't remember right now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It was something that I, I, I just seen it recently. Because a lot of the time I'll get, I'll get shit on for nitpicking moments that seem small, but actually indicate a wider problem. Mm. Um, I'm trying to come up with an example. I'm trying to come up with, because ex- I have examples, but, like, they're from movies that you won't be able to relate to. Let's, um, Might let's talk to. about, let's talk about Toy Story 4. Oh, okay, perfect example. Um, Toy Story 4, how, like, Bo Peep's design changes between movies. For, uh, her, her big old dress from the first two movies, it almost looks like it's held together with wire. Um, it's very stiff and it's held in place but in Toy Story 4 it's a lot more flowy and it's really obvious you know the reason why they did that is so that she can fold it back into a cape when she becomes like a lost toy or whatever someone could be like that's a nitpick obviously like the technology has improved so they're trying to like update Bo Peep's old design with like uh, the modern CGI it looks a lot better this way I'd be like no they they change the the structure of this character because they want their specific story to work. Like, this might seem like a small detail in the grand scheme, but it's an indicator of, like, where the writer's priorities are. They're willing yeah. to, like, rewrite history, essentially, and, like, retcon this character's design because they want her to go in a specific direction for this movie. Because if uh, Bo Peep kept her, like... Her, her wireframe dress she wouldn't last a second out in the as being a lost toy and th- that movie also forgets that she's made of porcelain and she's very fragile 
and she wouldn't last a day. She'd break. That was the reason why she was left out of Toy Story 3. Because if she made it to the incinerator, if she even made it to the incinerator with the rest of the toys, she would have melted. But we're I, left. I don't, I don't have a problem with nitpicks that go into detail like that. I, I go even further. I'd say that's not a nitpick. Oh, I, I wouldn't say it's a nitpick either. But when you, when you just say like, oh, Bo Peep's dress design changed for some stupid reason. And then the next thing, it was like, what? what, what? Yeah, that's yeah. like, that's not finished. You got to go into why that's a problem. Yeah. As long as you're able to explain yourself, I don't have an issue. Like, um, I guess Andy's design changing. Because a lot of people point out, like, Andy doesn't look like Andy in 4. That's, that's a nitpick. Like, Andy's not even relevant to that movie, let alone the way he looks. Well, he is relevant in that movie. He's a, he's a very brief. He's in a flashback. Oh. But yeah, I don't think nitpick is necessarily about size. It's about uh, significance. Mm. Just like the detail of the character's shoes changing between scenes. Yeah. That is a nitpick with, depending on how much impact it has on the plot. Yeah, I would agree. So, so where do we go from here? <laughs> okay, the only example I can give for like my definition of picking has nothing to do with movies. And I have, <laughs> it's, it's back to cars. I'm I'm sorry, but this that's the best I can do. All right, go for it. It's your field of expertise. Like if, you, like, if you have nothing bad to say about, like, again, the Lamborghini, for example, and an event to do it, but then you complain that it doesn't have a back seat, it's like, bro, now you're just complaining for the sake of complaining, just, just so you can seem, just so you can somewhat seem fair, but it doesn't actually, what you said means nothing. Because it, it, it means nothing because that's not the point. But well, yeah, because if they don't go into detail about, like, why not having a bad seat is a bad thing. Is that where you're going with this? But, like, dude, it's an exotic car. It's a, it's a super car. None of them have back, <laughs> none of them have back seats. That's not what you buy it for. I think I would go the route of, like, you know, if someone complains, well, it's not very utilitarian to not have a back seat. You can then argue, like... A sports in a sports car, the priority is not being utilitarian, right? It's about like style and like going fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that would be a, a that would be an effective counter. Yeah, I guess I gotta work on my counters and my examples because it's a bit limited. So I guess just to recap, like, do you think that? Uh, uh, do you think objective flaws can exist in a, in a piece of media? Oh, def- I think we proved <laughs> that they can exist. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Do you think media... It, I don't want to say they, sh- they all should be, but, like... Do you agree that it'd be better if media reviews were more consistent? If they all work with a consistent standard? Yes. And that standard needs to be, like, put into place yesterday. Because whatever they're doing now is just not working. Absolutely. I would say reviewers in general, in my mind, should have the same mindset that we do. Yeah. And uh, as I said, it, it makes conversation so much easier. Because someone could be like, I like the room. And they were like, wait, do you think the room is good? It's like, no, but, like, I really like it. It's like, oh, there you go. Like, just be for real. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to coming out of a uh, movie being like, that movie was really good. And they're like, what are you talking about? That movie's really bad. And it's like, oh, now we have a discussion here. So we can discuss yeah. the film and 
because we're all working with the same information we can use um the same standard and you know someone's going to come out on top because those two perspectives can't coexist well on the flip side you know still be failing except like that even if a movie that you really enjoy even though you really enjoy that it can still have flaws yes don't don't be like so whipped up by it just because of all the hype and you know what it made you feel that you can't see like what's what's actually wrong with it. yes thank you lion king movie i'm looking at you lion king 2019 yeah and then you know the conversation doesn't have to be like hostile doesn't have to be a bloodbath it could just be like oh okay you know i still really like it but i guess it's not as good as i thought but no this is the best movie in the world <laughs> because king, disney made it this is my childhood like bro stop just just stop it's the same shit just anyway yeah. anyway it's not even something that you're like beholden to you know, it's not like I watch every movie with, like, the old objective ones. I just, I usually save it for movies that I find to be, like, uh, noticeably bad or noticeably good. If I was watching, like, a middle-of-the-road, you know, I guess a movie like Tangled, whatever, just something I put on to have a good time, you'd be like, I don't know how well that movie holds up on the objective scale, but, like, I don't really care because, <laughs> like, I just watched that movie to have a fun time. I think it's fun. I is, like it. Is that how you watch Bullet Train? Um, yeah. Only like if I were if I were to go over it with a fine tooth comb, I might be able to find, you know, particularly weak points or particularly strong points. But um I guess I always have an eye open for that sort of thing, but I guess eyeballing it, only if a couple of things stuck out to me in that movie as being like, Okay, that's kinda dumb. Like, um, the guy, I forget if it's Lemon or Tangerine, but um, he gets knocked off the train and he's able to <laughs> oh. like crawl back on. Oh, that was bullshit. While the train is moving at like 100 miles an hour. It's like, yeah, that was nah. Some, that was some bullshit. <laughs> or didn't, didn't Lemon get shot? Or was it Tangerine? What of it? The, oh, the big one got shot, yeah. right? But he was like, he died, but then the movie changed its mind. <laughs> he, exactly. <laughs> Or even the the scenes were like so some of the scenes is like some of the physics of it and like just stuff blowing up and like bro yeah that that's just dumb like that's just, that's just not realistic. But I've seen criticisms of the movie that I also found dumb because I've seen someone be like, oh yeah, why are all these people just happen to be on the same train at the same time? I was, it's like th- this was literally orchestrated by the Black Death. <laughs> he hired them all to be here so they would kill each other for him it's just like well you just weren't paying attention exactly I could have said that the film is our reference and that's what we use to make our arguments yeah by the way you should watch Bullet Train I recommend yeah that said I do want to make a breakdown of the Bullet Train cause you know there's enough passion there to be like alright let's go over and see how well it holds up Well, I think that's the episode. All right. Is there uh, anything else you want to go over? Uh, no, I think I think we pretty much touched on every point. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I think we had a very good chat. This is something Thanks that I've wanted to have a back and forth about for a while now. For sure. Um, before we sign off here, is there a... Uh, this is your chance to sort of plug yourself. You know, where are you? What do you do? Where can people find you? Oh, yeah. Subscribe to my YouTube, M67V. I do car videos and, like, car discussions. Stuff like that. He does what I do for movies for cars. Uh, but I'm not gonna lie. I've taken a bit of a hiatus, but once again. But I should be back with some more content pretty soon so stay stay for for that also you might as well follow my instagram mj 67 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just because i'll follow you back i swear unless you're a bot if you're a bot i'm not following you back 
Are there any of your your alternate accounts you would want them to follow? Uh oh, you know what? I do have an alternate account called. You forgot this car existed, which is uh. Make sure you do the one. Wait, was it the one with the dots or the underscores? Oh yeah, make sure you do the one with the underscores because my other one got hacked. But, uh, I posted like. If you especially if you're a card nerd, you're gonna be entertained by this sort of thing, just cards that are like lesser known or that you may have seen once or twice, but like you haven't really like. It's it's not very memorable, frankly. And I go ahead and I write a. I do write ups, as for like maybe the history of it or like why, it's forgettable or why it's not very successful. So, if you're into that type of thing, go ahead and follow me on that. That's pretty much what I'm most consistent at as far as, like, creating content for better ways. All right. Yeah, that's that's that. Uh, Links to all of those will be in the description. Mohammed, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It was cool. That's fine. All of y'all, if you made it this far, thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the channel. We will be back to our regularly scheduled program. I promise. I can't say when, but <laughs> stay tuned. Haters without a cause is not going anywhere. Uh, one of these days, I'd like to have you on the show as well. Yeah, the show me proper. Up. The but, show. Uh, I'd be happy to come through. All right, then. Thank you very much, everyone, and I will see you next time.